Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambu Dasa Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One. Namo Saranto Suchedoye Allahudi Samyao San Putoshe. Wushang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa Bai Qian Wan Che Nan Zao Yu Wo Jin Jian Wan De Shou Chi Yan Jie Ru Lai Chen Shi Yi Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we can hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, hi there. Welcome to our Sutra Lecture. My name is Hung Shur. Today is Sunday, April 11th, here in the Gold Coast of Queensland. It's likely Saturday, April 10th, where you are if you're listening to California, that's for sure. Um, we are webcasting around the world our 10 stages chapter of the Flower Garland Sutra Lecture Series continues today. We're in the uh, verses of the 10th stage. We're at the very, very end. We're approaching, you know, the end of the 10 stages, which is just astonishing. I have a clear memory of saying to myself at one point, boy, if you could ever get the wherewithal, the Chinese say the zhiga, if you could get, have what it takes to explain the 10 stages, the 10, 10 grounds chapter, you probably could die right then and, and be happy. You know, you've done what you're supposed to do in a lifetime. And here we're, we're almost done. We're almost through it. So today, what we're going to do, we're in the verses. We're in, uh, last week, we talked about the, the uh, second stage. Today, we're on the third stage. And we're going to do a review. We're going to do the hits of the third stage. And what an amazing level of accomplishment this is for a bodhisattva. So, okay, uh, to get us going, let's look at, we'll come back to page 84 when we're done, but for now, we're going to invoke spiritual presence, and we do that by finding our text and blowing it up so it's visible. There we go. Expand our screen. There we go. All right. Make sure our instrument is in tune. After our weeks and weeks of rain, uh, this week promises to be dry and all the instruments are registering change in humidity. So. There's enough bad banjo jokes in the world. We don't want to contribute to them by having our banjo out of tune. Oh, 
welcome to join me if you care to with palms together. Let's in invoke the Avatamska assembly. Here we go. Namo Dafa Wampo to the bottom. Page 82. Okay, here we go. Our text is this one. Sanyo Ichi Jiu I'll give you a line, you give it back. Sanyo yi che che wu chang. Sanyo yi che che wu chang. Ru jian, ru shan, ku ji ran. Ru jian, ru shan, ku ji ran. Yen li yo wei chou fu fa. Yen li yo wei chou fu fa. Guang da zhi ren chu yen di. Guang da zhi ren chu yen di. All things in existence will soon pass away. Things in existence will soon pass away, causing pain, sharp as arrows, piercing the body, causing pain, sharp as arrows, piercing the body, rejecting the conditioned world, he seeks the Buddha's methods, rejecting the conditioned world, he seeks the Buddha's methods, with vast wisdom, he reaches the stage of blazing wisdom. With vast wisdom, he reaches the stage of blazing wisdom. Yep. What is it saying? Um, all things in existence will soon pass away. Causing sharp pain, pain as sharp as arrows piercing the body. So what is this? The Bodhisattva has reached the awareness of impermanence, transience. This is his, what he's super aware of. And transience, things coming and, coming and going, uh, things breaking up and going away, hurts like an arrow breaking your skin and lodging itself in your body. Now, how many people in the world today were shot by an arrow? Not many. So what's the conclusion? This text is, is time sensitive, right? This is from, a, from an era when arrows were major weapons technology advance, okay? The thing about an arrow is you could stand back from your enemy and still kill him, 
from 50 feet away, 100 feet away. Um, before that, you had to be in contact. If you had a piece of metal forged as a sword, that was weapons technology over a club. The club was weapon, weapons technology over a fist. So ways that humans devise to kill each other are constantly progressive. So from fist, you go to club, from club, you go to iron, sword, or halberd. And from there, oh my goodness, to be able to take a piece of wood, bend it, put a string or cat gut string and shoot an arrow. You didn't have to be face to face. So you could be much weaker, much less skillful, but if you had the long distance weapon, like a bow and arrow, you could kill a stronger, more skillful opponent from far away. So we don't, and then of course, weapons technology advanced to gunpowder and the repeating trigger mechanism. Um, I, I recall while bowing on the highway to with a practice of repentance, what came up to my mind was um, I have a relative in New England who created the repeating trigger mechanism for, was it Henry rifles or Sharps rifles? Uh, but through, because of his, his name was Eli Whitney. Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin, which enabled you to clean cotton more efficiently, putting people out of work but he also created the repeating trigger mechanism. So you could have a six gun, bang, 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 bang. And so what about the killing karma of the Whitney clan? It's my, my grandmother's side. Um, to be able to kill a lot of people faster, you know, with one weapon, you didn't have to reload through the, through the muzzle. So the muzzle loader was made a joke as soon as you had a repeating trigger mechanism. So. Eli Whitney, you say, bless his heart. I don't know. You say, curse his name. What do you say? So that's, I was thinking, what's the killing karma? There's, there's an ongoing debate in, uh, among theologians on whether the sins of the father are visited on the son or daughter. Uh, you almost need psychic ability to be able to answer that. But many traditions, Buddhist and non-Buddhist alike, talk about their, that karma has a generational residue, that if my dad or my grandfather uh, misbehaved in ways that caused karmic retribution, and then they left their physical bodies, do I, as the male heir, and the Bible talk less about female, about gender, whether the, the daughter, uh, Buddhist and non-Buddhist traditions alike say, yeah, indeed, that, uh, that the sin, sins of generations are passed on down. So is that a cultural teaching or is that a Dharma teaching? That's where the question arises. And there are arguments on both sides. So do I owe being a generation, uh, a, 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 what do you say? Being a descendant of Eli Whitney, do I owe uh, the depths of his killing karma for making it easier to kill more people faster. My goodness. So all things in existence soon pass away, causing pain sharp as arrows piercing the body. Easily, easily, we just say sharp as bullets piercing the body. Um, in America, that's a real thing with our, our uh, strange obsession with firearms. But now we could say all things in existence soon pass away, causing pain as sharp as a corona virus bug entering our lungs, right? The, uh, the, the, what is now threatening a, they call it a fourth uh, surge of virus, the, the variants, the one we, in the US, we talk about the UK variant, 117, um, is so small. The actual disease carrying 
organism is so tiny that they, you know, it's, it's uh, certainly invisible to the naked eye, but even you need uh, powerful microscopes to see it. And yet it is responsible for millions of deaths around the world. And uh, how, how strange that something that my eye can't see will kill me much more, I'm much more vulnerable to a virus than I am to a bullet or an arrow piercing my body. So life is fragile. And the Bodhisattva on the third stage wakes up to this. Okay. So what does he do? He, Yen Li, Yen Li, is it Yen? Yeah, Yen Li, Yo Wei, Chou Fu Fa. He makes a decision. She makes a decision that at this point, she goes, whoa. Is what's good about having a body that dies so many ways? Life is so fragile and there are so many ways to leave it that she makes a value judgment right here and says, I'm going to find a way out. Stop the world. I want to get off. Quick quiz. Who, who was the famous Broadway star? Stop the world. I want to get off. Anybody? You have to be a certain age. You're all too young. Anthony Newley. Ah, Broadway trivia. There we go. So that's from a past life. I, yeah. What kind of man am I? What do I know of life? Seems that I'm the only one that I have been thinking of, right? Yeah, too much, too many songs in my past life. Plaguing my meditation, you bet. So um, here's the Bodhisattva. Okay, let's take a step back. And uh, the fourth line here says what? It puts us ahead to the fourth stage. We're talking about the third stage, but these are sequential, talking about the Bodhisattva's curriculum as he is or she is learning how to be a better bodhisattva, learning how better to be a bodhisattva. The first stage, the stage of happiness, the bodhisattva is like working strongly with the self, things that, that attach me to my body, wanting to be happy, wanting to run from pain, right? So the, the initial lessons for the bodhisattva are to find happiness and things that actually generate happiness consistently and longer. And that is distinctly not stuff. Stuff doesn't make me happy long, right? So yeah, it, having, having good health, that's happy making, right? Having an opportunity to learn, oh man, meeting teachers who are willing to share things with me. Yeah, happy, right? But what I love about the, the Bodhisattva path is there's a, a system of, of lessons called paramitas, right? The perfections, the ways to go across, Tao, beyond the, the methods that take me across to the other shore, right? Those are called the paramitas, the perfections, and they match the 10 stages. They do. So what do we know about the paramitas? Well, the first one is, generosity, giving, right? Being able to let go and to give. The Bodhisattva at this first stage gives away the self. And guess what? Gets happy. Happy because every opportunity to be generous and to give reduces the attachment to this conditioned ego, this me in the middle, the, the me that is the most important thing in the whole world blotting out my vision of every other creature because they might get something good from me and reduce my happiness, right? All that is gone. The Bodhisattva sees through that illusory self that is coming and going all the time, right? Insult me one bit and I'm just, myself is incensed, enraged, right? Praise me a little bit and I'm so happy right? Tell me a little more. How good am I? Right? That's the self. And the Bodhisattva, through his or her meditation, says, 
I'm not convinced that's real. I, in fact, no bit of praise has ever increased my value a bit. No hint of slander has ever reduced my awareness of something inside that is deeply real and doesn't come and go. What's that? I'm interested in that. And the more I let go of the self and the more I focus on that nature inside that I'm discovering, the happier I get, right? Last couple of lectures, we talked about the fivefold fears the Bodhisattva now is unburdened by. And oh man, it's just, I mean, you feel lighter because why you, you're not afraid as you used to be. Situations arise, you go, seen it before, like I'll make it through. And even if I don't, if I'm focused on giving and helping others, then it was well lived. You know, I'm, this, I'm living now, this breath, good breath, complete. Why do I need to worry about breaths in the future? You know, it's all a gift. Okay, that's the first stage. Second stage, last week, what did we talk about? The 10 goods and the 10 evils. And uh, I remember one of my first encounters at Master Hua with Shifu Xuan Gong Shangren, Shang Xuan Xia Hua Lao Hu Shi. One of the things, he gave me Buddhist code. And I think it, I wasn't the questioner, somebody else um, asked Master Hua. I was, I was present, might have been when I took refuge. Somebody said, Shifu, what are we, what are we supposed to do? What, what's, how are you supposed to live? And Shifu said, Yan shi wu jie feng xing shi shan, chabadola. You could shang tian. He said, He said, hold the five precepts really well and feng xing, make a gift of 10 good deeds and you can be a deva. He said, You can go to heaven. Apparently, the person who asked the question had a theistic, maybe a Christian or Jewish orientation, maybe a Muslim orientation, and they wanted to get to heaven. So Shifu said, here's what you do to be a better person. Five precepts, 10 good deeds. Okay, what is that Buddhist code? That's Buddhist code. Yan shi wu jie, feng xing shi shan. All right, so what have we got? We got five things and 10 things. And okay, so right away, I came, I was a meditator. I was a Zen guy, you know? And what did, what did Dogen, Dogen Zenji say? He said, pay attention to your sitting, right? He said, just do that. Do your, pay attention to your sitting. Sitting is the Buddha, he said. All right, really good. And uh, you do that and you, your life improves a bunch, you know. But then you get to Gold Mountain Monastery and here's a teacher, a living teacher who clearly knows what he's talking about. Master Hua was undoubtedly an expert in Buddhism and Buddhist practice. He was the real deal, as they say. And what did he, he gave you a list. He said, do five of these things and 10 of these things. So it's like, whoa, I have to, I have to memorize, mem remember five and 10 things, what are they? So I looked at him, five precepts. And again, Buddhist code, they're presented as bu, right? Bu sha, bu dao, bu yin, bu wang yi, bu yin jiu. Don't kill, don't steal, don't go wrong with sex, don't lie, don't drug yourself. And it was like, hmm, that sounds punitive, sounds judgmental, sounds rules. I was not into rules growing up. I was an American boy. I wanted to, you know, break every rule. I was, I was raised in a time when the male heroes were outlaws. They were, uh, their motto was, do not fence me in, right? So yeah, cowboys, the cowboy ethos was big when I was growing up. And uh, we were alienated. We were making our own rules. Nobody could, 
could tell me what to do. So they have five of these, know this, know this, know this, know this, know this. It's like, sure. how do you crack that code and make it worthwhile? Well, decoding the Dharma is the job of the uh, student of the Dharma beyond sitting still. If I'm practicing like Dogen Zenji told me to do, when I cross my legs, what then? What, when I stand up, what then? I only pay attention to my sitting. Okay, but then I can't always, I have to get out of full lotus and go, you know, get on the bus and then what? What do I do? That's when you need interpretation. You have to decode the Dharma. And it took me, my goodness, years and years and years to get to the place where I heard those five precepts and stopped interpreting the Buddha as a cop who was trying to bust me if I broke the precepts and he caught me, you know. So, wow, that was a long, long process. And the key for me to make sense of that was when I realized, uh, actually it was Shurfu's direct teaching to me when he said, you still don't understand how compassionate the Buddha really is. He's on your side. He's just waiting for you to wake up, he said. And it was like, oh. So the Buddha gave those precepts as aids to your meditation. That's what made sense to me. It was what? It was if you like to pay attention to your sitting, like a good Zen person, and then you go ahead and kill and steal and lust and lie and drug yourself, you are obstructing your meditation. Your meditation will not succeed. The five precepts are guidelines to help you. The Buddha's on your side. He's waiting for you to wake up, help you meditate better. So that when you uncross your legs, any stillness that you attain through your meditation, any insight will sustain itself. If instead, you really enjoy your sitting, but then get up and kill. Maybe you don't kill, but you think drop dead, you rotten SOB, you know, or get out of my way. I want to kick butt today, you know. It's like those thoughts already reinforce the self. That illusory self becomes someone to watch out for because I got an attitude and get out of my way, you know. The self is reinforced by that sense of me and mine and, you know, so killing thoughts are the impact of a killing thought on my meditation is huge. Never mind going out with a knife or a machine gun or an AR-15 and mowing down strangers at Walmart. You know, of course, that's dramatic, awful killing. But what the Buddha was talking about was killing, turning the mind into a weapon and, and enforcing myself through the world. The ripples that I make with thoughts of anger already disturb the stillness that I'm looking for in meditation. So Master Hua took that and interpreted it further for we who understand ourselves psychologically. He said, Zheng shi sheng fu xin yu dao xiang wei bei bian sheng si xiang xin you he de san mei. He said, fighting is the attitude of winner loss. It's absolutely the opposite of the Tao. Furthermore, it increases your thoughts of me, mine, living beings, and creatures of the lifespan. Where's your samadhi going to come from? So it's like, maybe I better look at that Buddhist code again, those five precepts. So Buddhist code needs decoding. We have to get in there and work with it. And then suddenly it opens up. And sure enough, this is how Buddhist teachers pass on the Dharma to people who are serious about the practice and want to do more than get a buzz off of, you know, of slowing down, feeling better because they're, they're, they're quiet, mindful and mellow, you know, that's all good, but you want to go deeper, right? You want it to work all day long. And then stealing and lust and lying, drugs, the same. Then I got to the 10 goods and 10 evils. Oh my goodness, last week. And here's our pinnacle of Buddhist philosophy, 
Here's our guide to the cosmos. Here's our obscure, distant text full of Sanskrit that nobody can understand. The Abhatamsaka Sutra saying to me, you know what? If you steal, you know what happens? You can lose your human body if, if you really do harm others with theft. But more likely, what happens? You get retribution. The ripples come back to you for your stealing, for your theft. And you know what happens? You're poor. And the things that should come to you as your share of public weal, public well, well, welfare, don't come to you. Like you should be in line for your refund, your $1,400 you know, check from the government goes astray. Because why? You deprived others of what was their rightful share. As a result, the things that you get, you lose. Right? And you go, that's harsh. But you know what else? It makes sense. Cause and effect works like that, huh? And so a logical person, a person who is not invested in, in weaponizing news, you know, fake politicizing, fake news as used as a doctrinaire method of brainwashing to get political benefit. Somebody who is free of that confusion says, that's logical. I like that. Is there more of that? Ah, oh, says you know, the Buddha. Okay, yeah, sexual misconduct. Okay, suppose you cheat on your vows. You have a spouse, someone you have pledged your troth, troth to. And you turn your back on your vows and, and have affairs. What happens is what? Your, you can lose your human body if, if, it's, if your blessings are not sufficient. But suppose you don't lose your human body, you come back as a human, what happens? Well, your spouse will cheat on you. And further, the people who draw near to you, who you depend on every day, will not suit you. They won't be according with your wishes. You'll be surrounded by folks you can't get along with. As a result of having broken a relationship promise. So it's like you read that and you go, that's how it works. huh? And it's so much as if the Buddha, if the universe was a motor vehicle, the Buddha's lifting the hood and saying, see how the pistons go up and down and they push the, you know, the valves open and the gas comes in and the spark plug sparks it and the pistons turn the crankshaft and crankshaft turns the differential and the wheels go around. You go, cause and effect is the engine of the universe and the Buddha is showing me clearly when things go wrong, what, what I did to cause it. Thank you. That's so helpful, you know. So here's this, people say, oh, it's the peak of philosophy. Don't bother to explain it. You'll never understand it. You go, is there more of what I can't understand? Because that is too good. That is so good. It's the 10 goods and the 10 evils. So Shurfu says, oh, you want to know how to be a better person? You want to know how to succeed as a human? Yen shi wu jie feng xing shi shan. He gives you a piece of Buddhist code which is this diamond bright smelted through 24 karat chunk of wisdom that if you dip it in hot water, it will make tea. This is, you shine a bright light, you will get a spectrum of pure radiance out of this diamond refined rock of wisdom because it's the real thing. You go, hmm, hmm, that's so good. So this, this table, of, we, we tabled it out of the, the uh, goods and the evils and the two retributions from each of the uh, lighter grade of the ten, 10 goods and 10 evils, right? And so after the Buddha lines it out for you, he says, two of these, two of these, these are what happened. And he says, 
So the Bodhisattva goes, I see the 10 goods and the 10 evils as a garden and I'm gonna go live there, right? What I like, there's so many things that I, that I appreciate about that, that second ground, the second stage. And one of them is, you know, as I said, growing up uh, in, in middle America in a time when our male role models were outlaws and alienated loners, right? The fugitive and 007 and In Like Flint and John Wayne's loners and drifters, right? People who couldn't accord with rules, who didn't want rules, to have the Buddha say, ultimately these rules really help you because why you are empowered to build the world the way you want. Flip those rules over. How about that first one? No killing. What happens if you kill a lot? Your life is shortened. You're sick a lot because you harmed others' bodies. The ripples you created come back to your body and things don't go well for you. You live a short time and you're sick. Flip it around. Although the sutra does not specifically say this, but Shurfu encouraged us to be creative and think about it. Suppose you do the opposite of killing. Suppose I nurture life, benefit others. What happens? I live longer and I'm healthy. Sutra doesn't say that, but it makes sense, right? Okay, number two. Suppose I, instead of stealing, am generous, give good stuff. What happens? Not only am I not poor, but I'm... I have abundant material and the things that should come to me, I'm always in line for the largesse from the community. So vaccines come my way, scholarships come my way, right? Rewards, returns, uh, refunds come to me and I can share them with others. Okay, makes sense. So what do we, I started out by saying the 10 stages and the 10 paramitas we used to say six, but in the Avatamsaka it's expanded to 10, they match. The first stage, the happiness stage matches with generosity, the first paramita, giving, right? Second stage, which is leaving defilement behind, matches up with the second paramita, which is shila or precepts, morality, right? Okay balances. So you, there's this correspondence between the 10 stages and the 10 paramitas. Okay, today, our verse that we just, I, this is all preamble to get us up to speed on today. Today is the third stage. It's called Fa Guang Di, the stage where light comes out. Light is radiance, is emitted from the Bodhisattva's nature. And it's the paramita of patience, right? Kshanti paramita, where you are, you're able to endure, able to bear, okay? Now, of the paramitas, each one has its own, uh, I'm sorry, of the stages, each of the 10 stages, each of them has their own incredible character and contents and learning. Uh, it's a curriculum, right? Each one has lessons. And you can see the Bodhisattva as he or she progresses through the academy, the Bodhisattva Academy, they're handed a syllabus. And it's got a, you know, spiral binding, so you can open it flat, you can take it on the bus with you and memorize it, take it on the plane and, or walk with it. And uh, it's probably got plastic, so you can, if your fingers have, you know, you spill coffee on it, it doesn't stain it. And it's clear inside because they're instructions. And the way the grounds, the stages are structured, there's usually some verses that prepare you. There are called hearts. There are shin or attitudes that prepare you for absorbing the lessons of that stage. And they, they're different each time. There's a set of 10 usually. Then ready to uh, merge with the lessons of the, each stage, 
the, it describes what the Bodhisattva has now distilled from the previous one and what their, where their mind is moving now. And this is key because the 10 stages are psychological and physical and spiritual, of course, but there are changes in the Bodhisattva's uh, neural plasticity. Is that the language we're using these days? His, his I wanna say brain, say Xin, the Bodhisattva's mind is adapting. Wisdom is transforming ignorance, being transformed out of ignorance. It's the same substance, the same key, right? Same hydrocarbons in there, but with the holding of what are called the inner three treasures, Jing Qi Shen, the essence, the energy, and the breath, there's the energy, breath, and spirit. There is a transformation. The Bodhisattva is actually changing, growing. You think about, you know, before you started exercise, you didn't have defined muscles. You're, you couldn't do as many chin-ups on the bar, right? But now that you've been working out, watching the app on your phone uh, pace you through, you know, the rings. So you, your motion and your exercise and your standing rings get closed, right? On your, your app. The Bodhisattva now has actually developed and grown. So there are changes. And what the Bodhisattva sees with these new changes is the, the lesson of the next stage. At this point, I got it out to show you all. Where is it here? Notes for the 10 stages. There it is. Okay, Fa Guang Di. Here we go. That was last week. Make it bigger so you can see it. This is sutra text, kind of the highlights, and I've I've just blown it up so we can share. That was last week. Okay, let me just uh, I'll read the Chinese quickly, and then go into the English. So here, this is the third stage. Disciples of the Buddha, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, having stayed on the third ground, contemplates the appearance of conditioned things as they really are. That is permanent. I'm sorry, impermanent, suffering, impure, having no peace, subject to destruction, not lasting long, coming and going in an instant, not arising from a past time boundary, not approaching a future boundary, staying nowhere in present. Bodhisattva in the third stage has different eyes, can really see material things coming and going now. It's not that they weren't coming and going before, but he couldn't see it that way. She mostly was thinking about how to avoid pain and how to hold on to pleasure, right? Or just loving and hating or attached to certain states or visions of self. All of these things blinded her to the transformations happening, not only before her eyes, but inside her eyes, right? As the body goes through its, its aging process. The five skandhas are decaying right before your eyes. Just go take a shower and watch all the cells that, that flow down the drain, right? From a single shower, right? Bodhisattva now is so... Through his or her meditation, that they can see what says here, contemplates the appearances of conditioned dharmas. Buddhist code, it means every single thing 
in the world is cheng zhu huai kong, coming into being, abiding, going bad, and returning to its component parts, preparing to come into being again. Physics agrees, right? This is where Buddhist, Buddhism and science congru, con, congru? Do you, if you're congruent, do you congru? This is where they, they come together, right? Clearly, here's the Buddha, you know, who never looked through a microscope, is telling us that everything in the world is transient, passing on. The Bodhisattva lives there now. Okay, so we're watching a psychological transformation in the consciousness of the Bodhisattva, and he gives us plenty of description. But if things are impermanent, they're suffering. No, they don't satisfy because we cling to them and then they break, right? Ujing, they're not consistently pure. They're not 99 and 44, 100% pure like ivory soap, right? They're not safe. They're not secure. They go bad. They don't last. They, okay, they sheng mia in an instant. They come into being and pass away. I like this one, this pair, right? It's what? Not arising from a boundary in the past. You can't say when water became water because it's on its way to becoming ice or mist, vapor, right? Steam. And then, oh, it can, now it's water again. When did the water become steam? Uh, it's not approaching a future boundary and it doesn't stay in the present. This is what you call it wisdom. The Bodhisattva's wisdom is growing and he or she is making these observations in the laboratory of his, her own six senses. Very cool, right? So now hold that thought and something happens, right? Bodhisattva says further, look, Guan si fa wu jiu wu yi. Yu 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 bei ku nao tong zhu. Ai zeng suo xi. Qiu qi zhuan duo. Wu yu ting ji tan hui chi huo chi ran bu xi. Zhong huan suo chan. Ri ye zeng zhang ru huan bu shi. The Bodhisattva contemplates how those conditioned things cannot be saved, can't be relied on how they bring worries and lead to troubles, how they're tied up with love and hate, how they increase anxiety and sorrow, contemplates how they create misery that never stops. So the fires of greed, rage, and delusion burn without cease. He sees how dharmas bring with them a host of calamities, which increase and grow by day and night, yet all of which in reality are nothing but illusions. It's like, whoa, there's a dose of wisdom reality that, I mean, if, if this is all you heard today, that'd be enough to ruin your day, right? <laughs> like misery, man. The Bodhisattva sees through the illusion of everything being peachy and rosy and makes the next step. He says, right, it's because everything comes and goes that we're worried, that we're troubled, that we have the blues, that love and hate tie us up anxiety and sorrow increases because you can't hang on to anything. So what do we do in the face of this? Mostly get drunk. <laughs> Mostly fill them up again, lads. In my Irish heritage, man, you go to the pub and down a couple pints of bitter black beer because you're face to face with this reality all the time and nothing in, beg your pardon, Catholic theology prepares you to deal with it except go to Jesus, right? There's, there's no help in the world for this reality except blot it out, dull it, escape it, deny it. Life insurance? Doesn't help, right? Beating your spouse doesn't make you feel better. So what a what a shakaru, right? To have here's the Buddha 
saying, right, at this point, the bodhisattva is face to face with the reality of all things. And man, that's a bitter pill to swallow. Whew. Too much truth telling. Thank you very much. Right. So all of these, and here's the kicker of kickers, right? Which is all these dharmas, like the, the planet itself, talk about climate disruption. Lord. Okay. All these calamities, the, the fact anybody want to have a, some major nightmares, go watch the uh, movie called Sea Spiracy. Sea Spiracy. We, we were, we invested in the, the couple that created Cowspiracy, which is talking about dairy, the problem with dairy. There's another one, another couple, filmmakers, rebe rebellious filmmakers, documentary, documentarians, made a film about what's going on with the oceans and how humanity, this one species, humans, are, have declared war on the ocean and fish will be gone. If, you have, if you're raising grandchildren now, in their lifetime, fish will be gone. So, okay, never mind. Dharmas bring with them a host of calamities, which increase and grow by day and night and ready. Here we go. However, the Buddha goes like this. It's all an illusion. Psst, it's all an illusion. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Ah. Nothing but illusions. So here's wisdom of wisdom. Not only can you see how everything is like, everything we cling to, including this thing, is not going to last. But guess what? Don't attach to that either. It's an illusion. Okay. So I'm dramatizing this change in the Bodhisattva's vision in the third stage, but watch what he does with it. I'll just, I'm going to paraphrase it because we got to, we have limited time. This is so rich, right? So the Bodhisattva sees things this way. And what does he do? He says, man, I'm not going to invest in stuff. I'm going for the Buddha's wisdom. The Buddha escaped this. He, saw, he pulled the curtain aside and saw the wizard there and didn't just hate the wizard. He just said, not, that's not for me. I am not going to place my investment of my life and my, my family and my children and my elders in things that are unreliable. I'm going to go through the door the Buddha is holding open for us because his wisdom is inconceivable, incomparable, free of pollution, troubles, and worries. The Buddha gets to a place beyond fear and never retreats from it. Then I can rescue living beings from limitless suffering. Okay, right here is the Bodhi resolve. The, the Bodhisattva at this point, instead of what? Now, the point I wanted to make was Without the Buddha Dharma, face to face with the impermanence of all things, one response is to deny it, dull it. I'll think about that tomorrow. Right? Says Scarlett O'Hara watching Atlanta burn. I'll think about this tomorrow. Tomorrow's another day. Right? That's one response. The Bodhisattva's response is different. He says, the Buddha Dharma has a method for coping with the reality of impermanence, not freaking out, but instead getting to a place beyond fear, because at that place, I can rescue living beings from suffering. Pretty good. Selfless response. Selfless response. That's a different response than denial or drugging or you know, the, the nihilistic, cynical, negative response. So people who say, oh, you Buddhists, you're just all suffering all the time. No, not at all. Not the Bodhisattva. Okay, what happens next? Okay, I'm not going to read the text. We don't need to put our palms together. I'm not going to read the text. I'm going to narrate it because the riches of this third stage that we're looking at revisiting today because the verses give us this chance. 
It is so rich. What does the Bodhisattva do? There's a change in his or her attitude and they put everything down in favor of seeking for the proper Dharma. They wanna hear it, they delight in it, they rely on it, they follow it, they understand it, they accord of it, they cultivate. Because why? There is a promise in the Buddha's teaching that you can do something other than an unskillful response to the reality of the void coming for me and the world. You can transcend it through knowledge of the Dharma. The Bodhisattva increases his or her vigor at this point, and that ain't all. What else? Uh, uh, that's it. Not that. Not that. Not that. Okay. That one is called. Nope. It's not what I want. I want this one. There we are. Okay. 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 Contemplates the reality of things. They are impermanent. He sees how that, imp that coming apart when we attach to it makes us hurt. Says, hmm, I'm not satisfied with that. I want Buddha's wisdom. There are limitless advantages in the Buddha's wisdom. There are limitless disadvantages in the ignorance of thinking that everything is cozy and going to last. And so the Bodhisattva at this point in the, the third perfection, Fa Guang, emitting light, which is patience paramita, has 10 sympathetic thoughts for living beings. This is, okay, I, what I'm, I'm trying to sketch across the, the structure of this third stage, because a lot of things change here in the Bodhisattva's consciousness. He sees how much suffering is created by stuff falling apart and we cling to it. He has sympathy. It's translated as I um, lian min, right? Is that what it is? I uh, mean xin. That's the word for sympathy. I mean, it's like pity and empathy together. What is it? The Bodhisattva says, beings are alone with no refuge. And I feel sympathy. And here I'll put my palms together in this. One. Beings are poor and destitute. I feel sympathy. Beings are being poisoned by the three poisons, greed, anger, and delusion. I feel sympathy. Beings are imprisoned in the jail of the existences feel sympathy. That means essentially in a body. Beings are forever covered by the dense forest of affliction, the blues. He feels sympathy. Beings lack the perspective of contemplation. The Bodhisattva goes, ouch, I feel that. Beings do not desire wholesome dharmas. We don't even know to pull ourselves out. Feel sympathy. Beings lose the Buddha Dharma. We learn to meditate and then we go get drunk, right? He sees that beings flow with birth and death. He feels sympathy. Beings lose the means to liberation. And he feels sympathy. Right here is a major turning in the consciousness of this Bodhisattva. He doesn't feel cynicism. He doesn't feel angry. He doesn't go out and want to knock somebody else down in order to pick himself up or living be None of those things his heart expands. Seeing all of these, the reality of inescapable prison of conditioned things, the Bodhisattva's heart expands. Because why? Now, he's not clueless anymore. In the midst of clueless misery, the Bodhisattva's got a map. He's got a, a flashlight in the cave of confusion right? And rechargeable batteries. So he reflects 
on suffering that living beings experience. And he says, I should rescue those living beings. I should liberate them. I should purify them. I should cross them over. I should establish them in a wholesome place. There is a change now. He says, all living beings have fallen into the midst of great suffering. What expedience can I use to pull them out and save them so they get to nirvana? Okay. So there is, um, this is, I've taken us a, a deep dive into the third stage, but I want to go a little shallower so we can get to what happens next, because this is so powerful, so rich. Okay, he makes these conclusions that the Buddha Dharma is the thing that he needs to save them. He sets his heart on understanding the proper Dharma, the Jung Pa, the right Dharma, probably translate that as the right Dharma. Dil he doubles his diligent search for the right Dharma. Day and night, he wants to hear the Dharma, delight in it, rely on it, follow it, understand it, because the Dharma is what is going to help living beings wake up. So what does he do? He doesn't begrudge gems or wealth, gives it away, seek the Dharma. There's nothing that is hard to attain except the Buddha Dharma. I can meet somebody who can explain it. That's hard to get. Everything else, simple, right? He is, gives up inner and outer wealth. There's no reverence he can't practice. There's no pride he can't renounce. There's no service he can't undergo. There is no work, hard work he is not able to endure. If he hears a single phrase of Dharma he hasn't heard before, he's more delighted than if he got precious jewels that filled up the universe. If he hears a verse of proper Dharma he's never heard before, he's more delighted than if he became a king. If he gets one verse of Dharma he's never heard before, that'll help him purify bodhisattva conduct, meaning understand it better. That's better than becoming a god, chakra or Brahma for hundreds of thousands of eons. Okay, so, okay, palms down. All right, then in the 10th, in all of these 10 stages, uh, and actually in the 10 practices as well, a little vignette happens, a little playlet a little script, skit happens. Uh, it's all hypothetical, but it's an illustration of how this bodhisattva is like, he means it, right? She means it. It's a little uh, setting a benchmark. It's like, in the, like, for example, in the 10 practices chapter, there's the, uh, the first practice. Bodhisattva wants to give, he admires, he wants to learn how to be a better benefactor. And he says, oh, I really, I want to help people out. So I want to give anything I can give. On the spot, living beings come up and say, we're starving, we're hungry. Could I have your body to eat? And the bodhisattva goes, sure. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to practice giving. Here, take, take a piece of my, my thigh or, you know, my wings or, you know. Uh, and he makes this outrageous bow lifetime after lifetime he wants a huge body to feed every living being but he ties a rider on the contract he says anybody who gets a bite of my flesh must also make the bodhi resolve and become buddhas okay you game all right so right there's a, a disclaimer don't practice this at home right so it's like kids don't do this it's not bodhi the sutra and the dharma master are not telling you to go give pieces of your body to people to eat. Mm -mm -mm. So this is a bodhisattva's behavior, not we who are students of the, the past, right? So similar little playlet happens right here in the third stage, right? Here it is. Somebody comes, I have a phrase of Dharma that the Buddha spoke that can purify your conduct. If you can enter the pit of fire and undergo great suffering, I'll give it to you. The bodhisattva makes the following reflection. Since with a single phrase of Dharma, the Buddha spoke, I can purify my bodhisattva practices. If the 3000 universe, the, the universe of multiple syst world systems were filled with a fire, I would throw my body down from the Brahma heaven and endure it. How much the less a small pit of fire. Seek the Buddha Dharma, I'll undergo the sufferings of the hells. How much the more small vexation the room, right? So, the Bodhisattva rouses up his diligence and vigor in search for the Dharma. Now, 
there's an interesting, interesting phrase here, show you in the Chinese. Ru Shuo Xiu Xing Nai De Fo Fa Fei Dan Ko Yan Er Ke Qing Jing. Mutual fall. I'm not sure. I think Reverend Hungshur's computer is probably experiencing some difficulties. So I'm thinking maybe as we wait for Reverend Hungshur to kind of come back in, uh, we have some more developments on our mural at Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. That I think everyone might be interested in, in seeing. So let me put that up. We've been getting lots of inquiries into our, oh, our master's back. Great. We'll maybe show that later then. Okay, Jin Chuanshir, did you boldly step into the lecture? I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I was gonna share, I didn't get to it though. I was gonna share the mural pictures. I thought that oh, might man. be good. Okay, I didn't show it, what, I didn't share right. it. I was going to do that too, but I'll, I'll save it and you can do it, all right? Okay. Uh, I'll pass it over to you, not now, but in a while. Yeah, I think our internet hiccuped, we think. We're not sure exactly. So, chi whiz, I'm going to run out of time before I run out of third ground stuff, third stage. Okay, um, we were saying, we're back. Everybody happy? Sorry for leaving you so abruptly. Okay, the sutra says, can't, you got to practice what you preach. It's by practicing as spoken that you obtain the Buddha Dharma. Merely talking can't make you pure. Okay, um, so the Bodhisattva makes this little vow where he says, I'll throw my body into a pit of fire from the heavens if I can get a single sentence of Dharma or a verse, it says a verse, that I haven't heard before. Okay. So what do we make of that? It's the Bodhisattva has um, made a resolve, right? And... What you're seeing is an act of will. This is willpower. And what's, I wonder, probably if you had some sophisticated tools, you could measure chemicals secreted by the brain when you make a vow like that. In any case, there has been a change of mind, a change of heart. And the Bodhisattva's values are now in a different perspective. He or she says, 
I've seen the suffering that reality can bring to people who see it clearly. And I don't want them in the face of the truth, reality. Most people can't bear reality. That's, that's the assumption. You can't stand it. You can't stand it to see how nothing lasts. Face to face with the void, people freak out. They get negative. They lose all their perspective and they kill themselves. Groundhog Day, right? It's Groundhog Day. And what do they do? Well, you know, Bill, what's his name? Groundhog Day. He, um, what he did uh, was killed himself over and over again until he realized here was an opportunity to help people. And that's when things changed, right? In the movie, everybody's favorite, Bill Murray, everybody's favorite Buddhist film, Groundhog Day, highly recommended. He started helping people because he knew he was gonna come back. And so the same people he saw, he helped them. The Bodhisattva does the same thing. He says, she says, in the face of everything falling apart, I want to help people. I feel sympathy. I feel connected to them. And so at that point, his conclusion is, I know what will help. Buddha Dharma will help. Who can teach me? I need to learn so I can teach. Okay. I'm, I'm going to step out of the line of the third stage and say, you remember in the ninth stage, the Bodhisattva became a Ta Fa Shi right? He became the great teacher of Dharma. And that was a direct result of this awareness that happened in the third stage. So the third stage is awesome changes. What a powerful, powerful uh, transformation is happening here based on clear seeing and the ability of the human heart to respond with compassion when you witness suffering. Really important transformation here. People who say, oh, you Buddhists, you know, you're so negative. You think it's all suffering, you know, or even, you know, the Arhat who says, I'm out of here, you know, save yourself. Well, that's halfway home and it's an essential step, but it's not home yet. Okay, watch what happens next. Still with us? Still there? Here we go. Mm. Is it that one? Not that one. It's this one. Yes. Okay. What happens next? I'm going I'm not going to read it. I'm going to paraphrase it. What happens next? The Bodhisattva dwells in the first dhyana. Okay. What does that mean? The Bodhisattva enters Samadhi. Samadhi happens after these steps have been taken. You can get to the first, second, third, and fourth dhyana after you recognize impermanence, create empathy as a response, and go seek the Dharma, samadhi happens. Look at the, pre, the prerequisites for the dhyanas. Anybody can, but you don't enter the dhyanas because I want to have samadhi. You have to go through these steps of expanding your heart as a response to seeing the reality of impermanence, and then connecting it to a wish for the Dharma. What happens then? Second dhyana, third dhyana, fourth dhyana. The bodhisattva transcends thought and form, destroys relative thoughts, boundless emptiness. You go through the four empty attainments, right? This is the formless realm. The dhyanas are the form realm, Bodhisattva goes to the formless realm. Sukhung Chu, the four stations of emptiness, we say. There they are, right? Boundless emptiness, boundless empty space, boundless consciousness, boundless uh, nothing, not the slightest thing, nothing whatsoever, and neither thought nor non-thought. The Bodhisattva is refining his consciousness, refining his consciousness, because this is the interaction between what we start with, our human protoplasm, the Dharma, and practice of the Dharma. The heart expands. You see the reality of this thing going bad. You connect it to empathy because 
you see that you can transcend it, but living beings haven't. You're moved to teach them, and you understand that, under, that seeking, following the Buddha who succeeded, who went through all this under the Bodhi tree, you can too. And then the changes happen. You go through desire, form, and formless. The Bodhisattva, what's the phrase here? It says, Tan sui shun fa gu xing er wu so le zhao. He only cultivates according to the Dharma. He has no liking or attachment. Okay. Um, now, this is where, if you had to, uh, most people when they talk about the 10 stages, maybe haven't gone through at this level. And so they kind of skip over the hard work of the awareness of emptiness, impermanence, and not self, its effect on dharmas, the empathy that arises, the sympathy, the compassion that arises. They go right to the next point, which is what? Shantong Miao Yong, psychic powers. This is where psychic powers happen. Now, I, you know, we did it too when we went through this slowly. We were like all over the psychic powers part because this is the sutra's description of Shantong. This is real Shantong, not the Shantong of the phony psychic who wants your money and tells you they can inform you about your past lives, right? Or the person who has their tianyan, their, he their heavenly eye, their deva eye, right? Mm, not that, not that. This is the real psychic powers that occur only after the dhyanas, only after compassion, only after witnessing impermanence, right? Those stages, at that point, there is a major transformation of your consciousness and it starts to function. It works this way because why? These programs are all coded in there. We all can do this. The capacity, the potential is there in the mind, but it has to be smelted out. It has to go on the stove and cook. And then comes this wonderful fragrance of ways to help. What are psychic powers? They are the tools the Bodhisattva is going to need to act on the sympathy he felt, right? Say it again, no compassion, no psychic powers. No wish to learn the Buddha Dharma, no psychic powers. The way the Buddha described it. Now, having said that, there are other kinds, right? There's there's demonic powers, there's gui tong, there's mo tong, there's long tong, long ye or shan tong, right? Dragons have psychic powers, but they're not tethered to precepts and compassion and that wisdom of emptiness, right? That's, that's the thing. And that's why it's really important for us out in the world in the marketplace, if you meet somebody who tells you they got psychic powers, careful, right? Because why? They may not be the dharmas, proper, the right dharmas, psychic powers. They could be that ability of the mind triggered by another, got there by another path and not tethered to compassion. They can use them to harm, to benefit them and not you. So it's really important when you hear people say, I know your past lives, or this piece of property is perfect. You should buy this. You will get rich if you buy this property and start your business here. That's one of the number one realtors advertise psychic powers because they can match you with the property that will make you rich. Oh boy, right? Let me pay you to, to sell me real estate, right? Stockbrokers, ho oh ho. This one has the... Tianyan, they can tell which stock will prosper. Fart, fart. Be careful. Be really careful. Right? However, there are real Shantong. If you take the steps that the Bodhisattva takes, they function, but not for self-benefit. 
right? They function as a diagnostic tool so the Bodhisattva knows how to speak Dharma to get me to make the Bodhi resolve and then cultivate my nature and end suffering. It all comes back to finally, I have to take the steps through the gates of Dharma to save myself. No one saves us but ourselves. No one can and no one may. We ourselves must walk the path. Buddhas only show the way. Yeah. All righty. Uh, let's see here. I, I have a song that I want to share. I was going to sing earlier, but I um, got it. I, so much goodness is in this third stage. Chicken. Chicken, oh, chicken. Oh. Did it come up? Not there. Thank you. Not there. Nope. Be careful what you click because it will be yours. Oh, come back here. Uh, chicken, oh, chicken. Chicken, oh, chicken. There it is. I had uh, a fine conversation earlier today with one of our earliest Dharma friends. Um, Lani, who was one of the first five Americans to uh, leave home. And we also heard from Bruce Munson today, one of the very earliest, earliest pictures of Master Hua's Sangha, how hard it was to be a pioneer when there was no, not even dictionaries that would tell you Buddhist terminology, right? So, boy, they really had it hard. There was... You had their teacher pulling for them, but there was no, uh, no tradition to help them wake up. And yet they persevered, right? So uh, this song was written by Lonnie Bauer, former Big Shuni Hung Yin. I wanted to share it because it's... Uh, he took five precepts with a pure and upright mind, but his mind grew sloppy with the passage of time. Till one day he asked himself, what's the reason behind this uptight regulation against a little wine? The rationale behind holding or breaking the precepts, right? Staring at a bottle of primo vino red, he popped the cork, took a sip, the wine rose to his head, looking for some more divorce to wash that grape juice down, when along came a chicken pecking at the ground. Chicken, oh chicken, how you lost your head and ended up a Colonel Sanders take out treat instead. He heard a knocking now as he staggered to the door. It was the neighbor lady asking, did my chicken come through your yard? She said, sad, sad story. How he took a dive because he broke one precept. He blew it on all five. Sad, sad story. How this Buddhist fell and when he will wake up, no human tongue can tell. Okay, how many precepts have we broken at this point? We got, uh, see, he saw a chicken, he took it, broke, he drank the wine, right? Well, it's just a drink, what matter? And then killed the chicken. So we're, we're already down two precepts. Her beauty lit the alcohol, burning in his mind. No, I ain't seen no chicken. Come this way, he lied. Precept number three, but you're not bad yourself, he said. As he locked the door and in his drunken stupor, I'm a monk, so I shouldn't sing anymore. Precept four broke, the third precept, fourth, number fourth broken precept. 
sad, sad story. How will he survive? Because he broke one precept. He blew it on all five. Sad, sad story. Wisdom fare thee well. And when he will wake up, no human tongue can tell. Okay, well, here's our moral of the story. So take care, all you cultivators of the way. Don't think, because it's a little thing. You can write the rules your way. King Yama's got your number. You're listed in his files. And if you're off by a hair to start with, you're going to miss it by a million miles. Sad, sad story. How will he survive? Because he broke one precept. He blew it on all five. Sad, sad story. How this Buddhist fell and when he will wake up, no human tongue can tell. There we go. Certainly worth the wait. Thank you, Lonnie, for that lovely song. Truth. Right? All right. Uh, we'll continue next week our survey of the stages. I know we just got to the good part, the shantung when it was over, right? But uh, I think um, there are 64 lectures in this series. If you're really serious, you can go back on YouTube and Dharma Realm Live and dig out the lectures on psychic powers. We went through every one. We went through the, the Wu Yan the Liu Tong. The one that's not listed, interestingly, is number six, the Lo Jin Tong, the ending of bout flows, but the others are there. Find out how the Bodhisattva really knows past lives, really knows others' thoughts, really knows the, the Deva ear and the Deva eye. And the, uh, the amazing thing is uh, the, called the Shenzu Tong, the Ridi Pada, which is the 18 transformations of an Arhat. Oh my goodness, incredible stuff. So not a credible, genuine, credible stuff, right? Okay, I'm going to ask uh, Jin Chuan Shi or Jin Wei Shi. Jin Chuan Shi is on to tell us. Uh, I'll, I can stop sharing my screen if you'd like. And uh, you can show what's new at the Berkeley Monastery. And then, uh, here you go. Okay, and then if you want to give the announcements afterwards. Can you hear me? Can. Yep, you're on. Okay, good. Okay, so I just want to share the latest uh, Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. So here's our new Guanin Bodhisattva mural. I think people have been seeing it the last couple of weeks, but now it's officially uh, put up and completely done. So this is probably what you saw last week. You see the Guanin Bodhisattva mural there, and you have the platform below where they're working on it. But now it looks like this. You have a frame around it. And there's a, a layer of plexiglass that covers it. And actually, it ends up um, working out quite nicely. The plexiglass actually kind of makes it even more, um, it's like a really piece of artwork. You feel it's, it's a kind of a piece of artwork. And so you actually see our neighbors. Uh, just Marty came by on Friday night last night for his sutra lecture. And he said he, he drove up. He saw just a woman just standing there, just contemplating it. It's just standing there, you know, just watching it. He says, I don't know what you was thinking, but, you know, definitely lost in some reflection. So it has a power to it. So you can see, I, I made a little video. See the new see. mural at EBM? What's nice about the mural is actually it's colored, colored glass, reflective glass. So as you walk in the mirror, I don't know if you can tell, but it kind of glitters. The, 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 the light hits it different ways as you as you move closer. See the kind of the uh, that actually kind of actually magnifies the effect a little bit. Very nice. Now that the schools here are open in, in the, the elementary school, I see a lot of you know kids and parents and families walking by. Um, so maybe 
So this is this is actually what it was before without the plexiglass. You can get a kind of a full sense of the, the image. All the little cuts here are actually stained glass. The little tiny, um, tiny shards of glass, putting it all together. And the last thing was, I don't know, Dharma Master, you remember this picture? Yes. Uh -huh. This is the one actually um, we gave to the artist, um, Carolyn, uh, as a kind of a, a, a model. And this came from Dunhuang, the Dunhuang Caves. Right, Dharma Master? This was in that book. Yes. Right? Yeah. And so I, I, I just put it in the presentation. And I was just saying, no, compare yeah. the two, yeah. you can actually kind of see the similarities. Right. 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 Look, at the, yeah. look at the angle. I'm glad you remembered that. I, I had forgotten that, but that is actually, you can see the model. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So I need to figure out how to stop sharing here. Okay. Okay. So that's it. Um, in terms of announcements, it's just the regular activities at Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. Um, go to berkeleysmonastery.org. We don't have anything uh, exceptional. Uh, we had Ajahn Suchito speak this morning, which was very well attended and I think people really enjoyed it. And we'll be putting up his YouTube lecture, uh, the lecture on the Dharma Realm Live YouTube account very soon once I kind of confirm with him. So probably next couple how did, of days. How did it go? What did he talk about? It was two in the morning here. Otherwise, I would Yeah, yeah. He talked about unseating the inner tyrant. So how do we, how do we basically not follow the... Um, that in, inner critical, judgmental, controlling voice saying you're not good enough. And um, I thought, uh, I could honestly, I could see everyone at the end was really relaxed and smiling. <laughs> I got quite a few uh, emails saying, wow, that was wonderful. Really appreciate you could, you could share. And I could see Ajahn Suchito just has a way of kind of drawing you in with these kind of emotional landscapes. And then at a particular moment, he just pokes you and you go, whoa, and you see something, something new. So yeah. it's definitely worth watching if you're, if you're interested. He show, first goes through, you know, the, the controlling mind. And then he shows you how you can work from a completely different place in your emotional, you know, physical, somatic realm. So I think, I think people really appreciated that. And it's a really meaningful Q&A at the end. You know, people asking about how do you receive public criticism? How do you um, how do you deal with a school system that's constantly uh, in in kind of grades and judgment? And then how do you write so it's not becomes compulsive? So he gave some very good reflections. Okay, yeah, I'm looking forward to watching it. All right, appreciate that. Um, we are ready to transfer merit. Oh, by the way, th what that was, uh, uh, Jin Chuan, sure, do you want to tell us one more time how to find Ajahn Suchito's lecture? Oh, it would just be on this, this where, where people are watching right now, Dharma Realm Live, the Dharma YouTube Realm channel. Live. And the next probably day, it will be put up. I just need to confirm with him about any details he wants to change on the, on the video. So. Lovely. Okay. Yep. We also have we have talks there from Ajahn Sumedho, uh, from uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi, um, and other luminaries in the, the, the Maha Sangha. So now Ajahn Suchito has uh, contributed his wisdom. So that's great. Alrighty. Transfer the merit. We'll use Medicine Buddha's mantra um, all over the planet. People are discovering the variant uh, coronavirus strains are uh, causing widespread infection. So we can't let our guard down. Now's the time to really learn this mantra and keep it rolling, right? This is the Buddha's wisdom, medicine Buddha's wisdom for keeping our bodies and minds healthy. Hey. 
that by heart now certainly it can help hasten the end of the coronavirus epidemic so we can bow three times to the buddhas and bow to the master of all Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. So, lock how many friends on YouTube today listening in? So, 71? 77 in Chinese, on the Chinese side, 77. What have we got on, the, on our YouTube side? We have 150. Lovely. See you all next week. Amitofo.